you might have guessed this part, uh, Bloor Bike Lanes, but we're going to give you a historical perspective, a business perspective, a health perspective, polling perspective, and uh, also uh, we'll have some uh, political perspectives uh, when the, uh, the councillors uh, show up. So I'm, uh, my name's Albert Cole, I'm uh, the first speaker in fact, and uh, I'm with a group called Bells on Bloor. We've been uh, pushing for bike lanes since uh, 2007. And that's, of course, very recent history when it comes to the um, allure of the bike lanes. So the first thing I want to talk about, my job, is to give you a little bit of a historical perspective on uh, Bloor bike lanes. And I want to talk about the recent history. And by recent, I mean the last half century. So in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, when you go back uh, to the turn of the last century, some of you, I don't think any of you were around, but you might remember that there were antelopes on Bloor Street and uh, so that wouldn't have been surprised because just down the road here a fellow named James Lockery who used to be a rope maker he uh, took advantage of the fact that there was a huge demand in the 1890s what they called the bicycle craze uh, he took advantage of that to make his own bicycles he started manufacturing bicycles he wasn't as big as uh, uh, Massey Harris for example but he was uh, he was one of these uh, people that uh, got into the business uh, during the so-called uh, bicycle uh, craze. So I'm going to step up, move forward a little bit. So when we had the bicycle revival, that was like 1969, 1970, 1971, that was what we called the bicycle revival. So huge increase, not in recreational cycling, but utilitarian cycling, everyday cycling. So in fact, one of the streets that was most popular for uh, bicycling, can anyone guess what it might have been? Bloor Street. So in fact, Bloor was identified in a city study that started in about 1977, identified not only as one of the most popular in city bike, uh, bike routes in the city, but also the one that had huge potential for increase, but also had the highest number of uh, uh, injuries and collisions involving uh, cyclists. Uh, so what the, the, the outcome of that report, unfortunately, was not that they put bike lanes on Bloor Street, but they put, them, put a wider curb lane on Harvard. Now, Nancy might uh, know about this because uh, the wider curb lane on Harvard didn't serve people particularly well, and Nancy might tell you that she had a collision there in uh, 1992. But uh, So they put a wider curb lane on Harvard and didn't put anything on Bloor Street. Within four years, they realized, where were people still cycling? They were cycling on Bloor Street. And uh, so the commissioner said, let's take out the wider curb lane, but he didn't say, let's do something about Bloor Street. So that was in 1978, and in fact, Nancy Smithley from TCAT might want to know, at that time they said they simply assumed that businesses could not survive on Bloor Street without parking, on-street parking. That was in 1978. And she's going to tell us later on about her study that they did in 2007. So we know, you might know that our first bike lane in Toronto was 1979. It took 12 years to get another one, and when we got it was actually on Bloor Street, across the viaduct. Now, of course, there was no one on the viaduct, certainly uh, no establishments there that would complain about a bike lane. So that bike lane went in in about 1991, and a year later, city staff reported that uh, uh, it would be really easy to extend it, not to, it was in place from Broadview uh, to uh, Sherbrooke, would be very easy to extend it uh, to Spadina. So that was in uh, 1990. And that study was called the uh, a Route Selection Study for On-Street Bicycle Lanes. And uh, Gideon, who's here from David Suzuki Foundation, might be interested to know, that was uh, considered a quick implementation solution to climate change. So that was in 1992. Uh, the uh, recommendation was a crosstown Bloor Danforth uh, bike lane could be done in the long term. And the long term was 1993. <laughs> So that was, uh, that. so take us forward then in terms of uh, a direct advocacy also, there was this group that was formed in 2005, 2006 uh, called uh, Take the Tooker and it was uh, started by Angela Bischoff and Hamish Wilson. It was in memory of uh, Angela's uh, late uh, husband, Tooker Gomber. So that was why it was called Take the Tooker. That was in, uh, and this is uh, an action they did, invite a lot of media, they put a mock bike lane down, a tar paper box bike lane and obviously got a huge amount of attention because uh, bike lanes on Bloor have been uh, a matter of uh, interest for a long time. So our group, Bells on Bloor, we started in 2007 with uh, mass parades. 
our parades grew quickly from 2007 to 2009 to about 2,000 riders, so very popular. We thought naively at the time, all we have to do is show City Hall how popular, you know, lower bike lanes would be, and that's all we have to do. But of course, over the last decade, we've learned that you've got to do a lot more than, than that when it comes to bicycles. Uh, so I'm going to, and this is another uh, key moment, in 2007 we got a parking study on Bloor Street and the results were not that uh, businesses couldn't survive without parking, but that in fact only 10% of patrons arrived uh, by car. So in this town you have to do a lot to uh, get a bike lane. So here's, we, we formed a group called Safe Cycling Coalition, intervened in a court case around uh, the uh, Yorkville revitalization of Bloor Street and uh, uh, lost in that case, but our argument was that the city had not complied with provincial direction uh, to uh, consider the safety of uh, bike lanes. And in fact, the revitalization area of Bloor in Yorkville, a year later, some of you may remember, it was uh, a very uh, well-known case where uh, messenger Darcy Allen Shepard was killed uh, in a, by a car driven by the former Attorney General. Well, in 2009, we thought we'd finally get the bike lane. This is when Adrian Heaps announced, after a feasibility study was done for Bloor Danforth, he announced that uh, we're going to put a bike uh, way on Bloor Danforth, and he said, we think we can get uh, Danforth done by the end of the year. This was in 2009. He then got pushback from a number of the, uh, presumably other councillors. The uh, feasibility study became a comprehensive study, became an environmental assessment and uh, simply floundered then for the next uh, number of uh, years. So that announcement uh, didn't go anywhere in two years. There's a map of what the idea was about uh, a bike way across the city. This was in 2009. This is 2014. 2014 was a good year for Bloor bike lanes. We had our bike stock event which rallied uh, cyclists around the idea of bike lanes on Bloor, on Danforth, on Young Street. It's also the year that uh, Joe Cressy was elected. He became a champion of uh, Bloor bike lanes. And also 2014 was the year that all of the residents associations got together and, and uh, called for a pilot for Bloor a bike lane. That was all of the residents associations unanimously uh, made that uh, call. And in 2015, Cycle Toronto launched its Bloor Loves Bikes campaign. That was a very significant development as well. And also at the same time, a lot of other groups started joining, joining in, calling for the pilot. Those were uh, doctors uh, groups, nurses groups, uh, David Suzuki Foundation, that was significant as a national organization to join the fight. And here's what the pilot was a great success in terms of cyclists, but also in terms of conflicts between different uh, road users, a success for business, business was up. And uh, that was the pilot was supposed to show that bike lanes are good on Bloor. That's why we do uh, pilots. And in fact, and here's a, a quote from uh, 2000 when the pilot was uh, uh, was being debated at uh, City Hall. Here's Joe Cressy here asking the question of the general manager of transportation services. He's asking about the study that was done for Bloor Street, and he asks, "Has this been one of the most comprehensively evaluated?" transportation studies for cycling infrastructure or any project in that matter in recent history. He's asking this of the general manager of transportation. She says, yes it is in my experience. He then says, so this is in the city of Toronto one of the most comprehensively studied projects we have ever undertaken. She says, absolutely, and I would say in North America. So that's 2017 and since that time, this the pilot was supposed to show that uh, you know, that's why we do pilots, that if they're successful, we move on. We never have, so we've installed uh, since that, uh, that time. And uh, here's what we're fighting to change, of course. This is at Shaw Street where the uh, bike lane ends, so does safety for a uh, cyclist. And uh, that's uh, a little bit about the history, recent history of the uh, Bloor bike lanes. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to Nancy Smith-Lee, who is the uh, director of the Toronto Centre for Active Transportation, formerly called Toronto Centre for Active Transportation, and they've done uh, some excellent uh, work over the last uh, a number of years on uh, studying uh, bike lanes and uh, active transportation. Thanks, Albert. Um, just 
just wanted to, uh, to say hi and welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, and Jared mentioned that just in case anybody wants to know, there's washrooms right across the hall. Anything else, Jared? I think that's, I think that's it. Uh, so, but thanks for coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the, um, the metrics that we used, um, both at TCAT and at the City of Toronto, to evaluate the blue bike lane, which is Albert has said, is the most evaluated uh, bike lane in Toronto history. So here's what um, the next slide is where uh, is how Blue Street looked before the bike lane was installed and, and as well as after. So before there were two lanes in each direction. Uh, during off-peak times, the, the curbside lane was used for parking, so there were 303 spots, and there was no dedicated space for cycling. And so after what we have on this one section, uh, there's one traffic lane in each direction, uh, rush hour travel lane was eliminated, um, as well as 136 on-street parking spots, but there were 167 car parking spots created, as well as 78 new bike parking spots. And as we know, bike lanes were added either beside the curb or beside the parking. So as Albert mentioned, um, installing bike lanes on a main street like Bloor requires a, you know, a significant amount of, of parking to be reduced. And this has been an issue of some concern, especially for merchants who are concerned about the potential negative impact that that could have on their business. So we, at TCAT over the past 10 years, we've looked at this on three separate occasions. Um, and our main research question has been, will removing on-street parking for business bike lanes hurt the bottom line for local business? So on the left um, are a couple of reports that we did, um, released in 2009 and 2010. And as Albert mentioned, we found uh, that only 10% of people were actually driving to Bloor and that patrons arriving by foot and by bike were visiting the most often and spending the most money. At the time, that was a really surprising result. There hadn't been any, any kind of studies that had shown that. Um, since that time, there have been a lot of studies that have been done um, in North America and other cities that have shown really similar results. Um, the, some of the other things that we found, merchants overestimated the percentage of customers who drive. Um, we also found that customers who want bike lanes are more likely to spend more money per month than those who prefer no change to the street. So then most recently, then, is the, is the study on the right in 2017, um, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So the opportunity was that in, in 2015, the city was undertaking a feasibility study uh, to identify design options and impacts for the bike lane pilot in Blue Annex and Koreatown. And at the time, the, um, the economic, looking at the local economic impact was outside of the scope of what they were, what they were looking at. So um, our study purpose is up here. So we were basically wanting to look at the local economic outcomes, positive, negative, or net neutral, of installing a bike lane on floor and understand also the role that's um, played by the travel patterns and attitudes of both visitors and merchants. So we, then, we looked then both before and after the installation of the floor bike lane. We did visitor and merchant surveys, uh, bike counts and vacancy counts of storefronts on Bloor Street uh, between Madison and Montrose. And we also compared that with similar studies, with similar surveys uh, on the Danforth, which, was, which had no bike lane installed. So the findings then, uh, generally, so they, um, you can see here on the, on the board that all of the, the findings were, were generally positive. We found that, we found that businesses reporting uh, 100 customers per, or more per day went up. Um, the reported spending uh, that visitors were spending went up. Uh, spending by customers arriving by foot and on bike also went up. Uh, the frequency of, of customers arriving to these businesses also went up. The vacancy rates remained stable on Bloor. Um, as well, the, the city looked at, uh, they purchased Monero's point of sale data, uh, which is the credit card transaction data, and they found that that also was, um, was higher than in the surrounding area. So, but interestingly, and this is, this is I think, really a very important um, findings are around safety. So 75% agreed that, and this is from now from the city's surveys, the city did thousands of surveys and found that 75% agreed that cycling on floor is safer now. 85% of cyclists now feel safer, only 3% did before. 
And interestingly, 66% of motorists uh, feel comfortable driving next to cyclists now, and only 14% did before. Uh, the city also looked at, they did a near-miss conflict study and found that conflicts were down um, overall between road users. Uh, this is an interesting finding as well, just, um, just the, how different it is how um, visitors and the merchants are traveling to Bloor Street. So um, it may be hard for you to see in the back, but the, the, the biggest, um, the most prevalent way that people are, or visitors are, are traveling to Bloor Street is walking. So about half of half by walking, um, about 25% 20, by uh, transit, 10% by car, and of course, uh, almost 20% by bike. Um, and then, but for merchants, about 50% um, are driving to Bloor Street. So I think that's a really interesting finding, just how different that was, and we didn't find an increase in merchants um, biking to Bloor Street. So I think the bottom line, though, is like there's lots that we could be looking at. We actually find this really fascinating to dig into this kind of stuff at, at TCAT. But you know, we know that uh, the bike lanes make it safer, and that's really um, the most important metric that we should be considering. Thanks very much, uh, Nancy. are all available on our website, so please do feel free to go and download them if you're interested. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Nancy. So now we have a real live business owner that's going to speak to us, and uh, that's a, thanks very much for uh, coming, Jennifer Klein. She is the owner of Secrets uh, from Your Sister, and uh, which is at Bathurst and Bloor, and uh, we're, I'm going to hand it over to her now. Hi, thank you everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to start off by saying um, I've owned my business, I'm going into my 20th year of business, so I've seen many ups and downs uh, in the retail industry, and um, when I heard about the bike lanes, I was more excited than anything, um, and this December, I actually had the thought of uh, having a, a furniture piece designed to hold bicycle helmets, <coughs> Uh, because uh, one of the biggest benefits of this uh, of the bike lanes on the board has been an increase in cyclists coming into the shop, or maybe now they're coming more with their helmets. Um, so after going through um, all of the pilot project, uh, that was a really pleasant surprise. Um, I tend to take a positive outlook on things, and I enjoy being an entrepreneur and the challenges that uh, I'm faced with, um, having to go out and find my customer and have people come to our store. I think that helped me in um, uh, helping my customers accept the bike lanes. Obviously, people are going to be happy and people are going to be upset. This was a very, uh, you know, people were on both sides of the, um, of the stick when it came to the bike lanes. And I found that being positive about it, informing people um, about the benefits of the bike lanes, how it would help us all, how all major cities uh, move in that direction of having bike lanes. Um, I feel that uh, having that positive outlook was one of the first things that I could do as a business owner to help my customers um, uh, feel better about them. Um, I also think that change
have uh, Sharon Zygman. She's from Doctors for Safe Cycling. So we're going to uh, call on her to, oh, she's over here. Uh, she's going to give her a prescription for uh, Laura Street. So thanks very much. Thank you. Not great with mics, so I hope I'm not coming across too loud. Um, I, I'm very lucky I'm here tonight with the, the co-founder of um, Doctors for Six. I'm not the founder, I'm Peter, and he will help me answer questions afterwards. I also feel really lucky to be invited here uh, tonight. Um, for me, on a personal note, I, I have a personal relationship with the bike lanes on Bloor. I moved back to the city in 2003. And in those days, it really was take back the tuber. In fact, I was telling Peter, it was very exciting when I parked tonight, somebody had one of those stickers on um, their bikes, and you probably know who I'm talking about, but I first associated the um, bike lanes on Bloor with um, um, Tuker uh, Gomber. And then later, I saw about Bells on Bloor, and I was really fortunate, I got to participate with my son in a couple of Bells on Bloor, it became a Mother's Day gift. Um, it was a really good way for him to uh, participate in Mother's Day and just add it to the card. And it was really, really exciting and absolutely thrilling to see the um, bike lanes in, in fruition in uh, August of 2017. Thrilling to take a picture of a selfie of myself on the bike lane and bother both of my children um, with these pictures and, and just be thrilled to see it come into existence. Um, I feel also blessed as a physician that we have a different science in, in assessing health outcomes. And rather than spend a lot of time tonight on exact details and studies, I'm going to summarize a few studies, but I would really like to um, defer any of you to our website, um, Doctors for Safe uh, Cycling. The place I actually really wanted to take off from, and I'm so glad, Albert, that you mentioned uh, Lee Tuber, um, who I never to meet, and I want to also mention in the context of coming into the school tonight and noticing that it's Mental Health Awareness Week. I, I'm a psychiatrist, Doctors for Safe Cycling. There's about 200 doctors, most are family doctors, many of us are specialists. We have quite a few emergency room doctors. We're mainly right now representing uh, physicians in Toronto, though I'm sure that we can easily get national uh, buy-in. Uh, but as a uh, Toronto psychiatrist, uh, um, a situation like what Mr. Gomberg went through is, is very um, close to my heart, and I will explain how it relates to the Bloor bike lane. He suffered from depression, and, and I'm sure it was not an easy decision for him to accept medication as a treatment. I don't know any of the details of um, what he went through. I do know that one of the side effects of antidepressants, and it was probably just becoming more evident uh, around the time that he took his own life in 2004. Now it's what's called the black box warning, but it's, it's an indication on all boxes of antidepressants that they carry a paradoxical risk of increased uh, suicidality. And as a physician, when I recommend medication and I do informed consent, I have to explain that risk, and then I participate as best I can in mitigating that risk, both in the decision I make around the dosing and in the communication around that. But I have no ability to change the antidepressant itself. I can't right now go back to school, become a, a pharmacist, and even look at the solution to the side effect of the medication that I prescribe the most. Also, in general, the benefits of antidepressants are at most 35%. Um, so I have a treatment that doesn't have an ideal uh, effectiveness, and I don't have a good solution to its side effects. I want to compare that to a treatment called cycling, uh, especially commuter cycling. And there's been some amazing research looking at the multiple health benefits of cycling. Some really amazing research in the uh, British Journal, I want to give the exact year for anyone who cares about um, details. It was in uh, 2017. They actually studied commuter cyclists, not people in spin classes. They studied commuter cyclists. And many of us uh, recommend commuter cycling as a great way to both get around the city, to decrease the carbon uh, footprint, to be environmentally sensitive, to decrease noise pollution, to contribute. I, I think the point's been made about um, cyclists as members of a community and, and as shoppers.
but um, commuter cycling is a great thing to be able to recommend. And it was wonderful to see research coming out of England, which in some ways I think is, is similar to uh, Canada, um, looking at the multiple health benefits, including at least a 50% reduction in cardiac illness. Again, what I get to prescribe, we're not getting 50% reduction in, in illness. A 40% reduction in the types of cancer that they studied, and, and that's uh, well uh, described in the article. So that's really exciting to be looking at a treatment that has such, such high outcomes. To also be looking at something that is both preventative, because cycling and, and all exercise is about wellness, not just about illness, so that I could possibly get to prescribe something that is a health benefit. Where it breaks down for me is it's lethal. Um, I mentioned the lethality of antidepressants, but, and Peter and I, we don't know off the top of our head the actual statistic of the uh, percentage of lethality if I recommend cycling to a cyclist in Toronto, but it's probably higher than 10%, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and so if I'm getting informed consent around a prescription for cycling, I've got to include um, lethality, that um, taking my advice could be lethal. Unlike the antidepressants where I don't know the solution to the activation side effects and risks of suicidality from antidepressants for depression, I actually do know really, really good data, evidence-based data that has been replicated, data that's local, that's Canadian, data that's coming out of Toronto, that argues that protective bike lanes actually will mitigate the side effect of me prescribing cycling. So as a physician, it's really exciting to have a treatment and to have a solution to its main side effect. It's also exciting that I can participate in the solution and that I can inform others. Like I can't sit around with drug companies, call up Eli Lilly and, and discuss with them what to do with their medication to change, but I can sit with my friends and I can stand in front of an audience like now and talk about a solution that I know is gonna work. So I, I as a physician, feel incredibly passionate about uh, recommending um, protected bike lanes and extending the, bl the Bloor bike lane as west and as east as we can. So thank you for letting us come tonight. Thanks very much, uh, Sharon, for that uh, compelling uh, presentation. Uh, so we've heard from uh, business, we've heard from the medical profession, we've heard from uh, uh, the uh, research side. So now we're going to hear from uh, Bloordale Community Improvement uh, Association, Nahum Mann, who's going to tell you about, uh, give you a community perspective on uh, uh, Bloor um, uh, bike lane extension to Hyde Park. Thank you. Hey, everyone, and thanks for having me here. So. Uh, you are currently in uh, Bloordale, um, and here in Bloordale we have the Bloordale Community Improvement Association, which is essentially our residence association um, that works on how we can improve our neighborhood in a wide um, But I, I'm also here, uh, I, you know, I work, I live, I shop here locally. Um, I'm a six-year-old who goes to school at Pauline, which is a school here and so in some ways I wear many hats here in the neighborhood and I just wanted to talk for a minute about um, why Bordale um, makes the bike lane extension westward uh, so doable and so feasible uh, and why it really fits and this is a very very vibrant community you know as a parent at a school every day I see parents dropping their kids off to school um, waiting for them to get in the door and then hopping back on the bikes and heading to their job, uh, to their office to work. Um, I know many, many residents as well uh, without kids that uh, are using bikes to get to work, whether that's a business maybe they own in the neighborhood um, or whether that's an office that they're traveling to outside of the community. Um, and on top of that, you know, lots and lots of people that are biking recreationally and we have great access to Dufferin Grove Park, we have great access and proximity to, to High Park and really the health and the recreation of cycling is something that uh, people in our neighborhood enjoy. And someone was talking earlier about um, the deliveries uh, and you know, and, and sort of that transition time um, in the existing bike lane and the annex and, and the, the adjustment around deliveries. Here in Blue Dale, actually, we have a lot of our deliveries already happening 
on these side streets like Pauline, <coughs> Margareta, Emerson. Um, and so we're really geared uh, and ready to have the extension come out this way. Um, we're also a community that's really driven towards sustainability. Uh, we, uh, we have a really fantastic BIA in the neighborhood and thankfully um, they've done a ton of work locally. If you walk around you can see all the trees planted along Bloor. Uh, there's been a number of activities, events, uh, focused on environmental sustainability as well, around planting trees, around living and shopping uh, more sustainably. Um, and really exciting stuff happening in the neighborhood too around using our laneways. Uh, I'm really excited, I see Meg in the back is actually hosting a Jane's Walk this year on living sustainably. So this is really like in the roots of our community um, about uh, what is good for the environment, what's good for our health, what's good for our community. Um, lastly, though, I really wanted to just talk uh, from a personal perspective um, about community safety. So late in 2017, uh, I was routinely biking uh, to work, one of the offices that I work on, uh, work at, and for the first time in 10 years cycling in Toronto, I got doored. Um, and it was like, you know, it was that experience. I got taken to the hospital, I had a gash on my side. Um, I felt like, wow, that was a, was a pretty intense injury. Uh, but two weeks later, my fiance got doored almost right across the street from this school. Um, and even right now, you know, she's still in a lot of recovery from uh, traumatic brain injury, from post-concussion symptoms. Um, and, you know, we know that a lot of people enjoy biking. They choose biking for so many reasons. It might be their health. It might be recreation. Um, but we also need to remember how many people in this city rely on transportation methods like cycling. Um, and this is, you know, I, I see so many people even biking through the winter. Uh, and this is really how people need to get around. Um, and so we really need to make sure that we're building uh, a city that's inclusive for everyone and that's safe for everyone. And that is why the Bloordale Community Improvement Association fully supports the expansion of the bike lane. So thanks. Everybody. Thank you very much, Nabel. So, uh, we have uh, two councillors here. The area councillors have rushed down from uh, City Hall where they've just approved the uh, uh, King Street pilot project. All right. There were three people voted against it. I'm presuming it's not uh, Mike Layton or Anna Pilot. So, I'll call on uh, Mike Layton now. He is a councillor, not for this specific area, but, he, but the, the neighboring area that includes. Uh, an area between Shaw and uh, High Park. So thanks very much, Mike. Great, thank you very much, Albert. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry we were, I arrived a little bit late. I snuck home to see my kids before, uh, before their bedtime. Uh, it seemed particularly apt because I take the Bloor Street bike lane every single day uh, to ride to work. And uh, I take it every single weekend uh, to get my kids around town. Uh, many of you might know I grew up on the back of a bicycle. On my, uh, when my parents split up, uh, my, my, my dad and then uh, Olivia joined our family. We lived without a car. We lived in downtown Toronto. There were no bike lanes. There was one bike lane. Can anyone tell me what that bike lane was? Robert. Martin Goodman Trail. Come on, people. <laughs> Come on. There was one bike lane. Uh, we were out there alone. There wasn't a lot of people out there uh, cycling as well, partly because the cycling culture really hadn't developed. It was dangerous. It was dangerous. I know more than one occasion when, uh, when, when cars would cut my dad and my sister off on the tandem or something like that. Uh, and there would be an altercation, and it was uh, it was nasty out there. Uh, fortunately, over time, uh, we've we, we've slowly, very slowly, built out that network and built a, a, a really solid foundation that we can continually improve on in in our cycling culture uh, on uh, out there on the roads. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I know um, because we just went through, or a couple of years ago went through the, uh, the discussion of uh, Bloor Street bike lanes uh, on east of east of Shaw. I can tell you, when I was elected in 2010, despite the years of advocacy on the subject, 
uh, of, of bike lanes on Bloor and it being dri written on or, or drawn on to just about every map, it still seemed like a long, long way away. And it wasn't until a concerted effort and a sustained effort uh, by a few key folks uh, really did drive it home and, and got us to where we were. And it wasn't easy work, and it's not going to be easy work if we're going to have that dialogue, because it's not an easy dialogue to have. So I wanted to bring just three lessons that I think that we learned uh, east of Shaw. And so I'm, I'm, I got in an interesting spot, because I have, I have both the westward expansion and eastward, ex eastward expansion in my ward. Uh, so we're going to be fighting on and, and, and pushing on both fronts. But the three lessons that, that I wanted to, to leave with you today, whether or not you're a supporter of, uh, of the Lane on Bloor, not a supporter, or indifferent, and don't, don't know yet, want more information. One is get comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. Get comfortable talking to your neighbors, talking to businesses, talking to family members that, that might not agree with you. Uh, that, that is healthy. That's a good thing for, for a society, to have positive exchanges and to learn new perspectives. And that was one thing, if you're at any of the public dialogues around uh, Bloor, uh, uh, the, the, the section that's done, uh, you'll recognize that, that you probably learned something from those exchange, exchanges that helped you either understand that perspective more, uh, the other perspective more, or improve your argument. <laughs> if you're on both sides. The, the other one is, is this, this will take a, a, a lot of work, but don't, so the, the, the key to the expansion east of Shaw was, this, was the tent that we built. Bloor Street was built with a big tent, with a lot of people holding up that roof, with residents associations, with businesses, with BIAs that were willing participants in the experiment. It was built with uh, uh, individuals that were activists in the neighborhood as well as citywide. We had a strong foundation for success. Was it perfect? No. But that's the third lesson. Don't let perfection get in the way of progress. Because there are many different kinds of cyclists out there. There are many different skill levels. There are many different levels of comfort. Myself, I, 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 while, while I'm a cautious cyclist, I don't cycle for speed. I, I cycle to get around. I cycle for utility. I'm not afraid to run the gauntlet between a parked car and a, uh, uh, and, 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 a moving, and a moving lane of traffic. But my partner, is quite cautious. She didn't grow up in Toronto. She didn't grow up cycling on, on, on bike lane and list streets in, in this city. And she likes it to take a lot smoother. And that now the key is we have two kids on the back of the bike, so I'm cycling her way. And Bloor Street, while it's not perfect, certainly not perfect, I cycle my kids east of Shaw on a regular basis. And you can tell the second you get west of Shaw, the level of anxiety goes up, the, how cautious you are go up, the whole pleasantness, that's a word, the, the, whole, the, the how, how you feel east of Shaw and how you feel west of Shaw is like night and day. Let's say it's like a daydream or a nightmare. And the reality is we need to, as a city and as a community, build safer streets. We want to build, I think, all, we all have some of these same goals, a more prosperous, safer city and community. And that's why I'd, I'd encourage you to, to put your energy, whether or not you're in support of it or, or, or not, into the conversations with your neighbors about the future of the street and how we can achieve those, those same goals together. And, and I think if you do open up your mind and your heart to those conversations, uh, we'll find the path forward here. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to take, I'd love to tell you, that, that because we got the foot in the door, it's going to be easier, but every inch of that lane will be, will be more dialogue, more discussion. Uh, as the separation improves, there'll be more uh, arm twisting at City Hall with, with some of our bureaucrats about what is possible and what's not. Uh, and then when we start to try to come up with some innovative approaches to how we address some of the concerns of businesses and neighbors, <coughs> that's going to take some compromise as well and some, some, some deep reflection and discussion amongst the community. So I'd encourage you, if you're out here tonight on this beautiful evening, then I know that uh, that's something you're willing to do, and I look forward to working with all of you to achieve that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
uh, Mike, and thanks so much for uh, all your work on the uh, the work pilot. I, I should note that uh, if you haven't filled out the survey, we have researchers here tonight from Copenhagen, and they're researching the Toronto cycling culture. And we had a quick conversation about advocacy in Copenhagen, and the idea that anyone needs to advocate for uh, bike lanes in Copenhagen, they say, well, we don't really even have advocacy groups, but we certainly have uh, bike lanes. So hopefully one day our culture will, will be there. Um, so we're uh, fortunate as well, not only to have Councillor Layton here, but Councillor Anna Bailao. This is in fact uh, her ward, uh, so she's going to uh, talk to us right now as well. So thanks very much, Anna. So I'd like to start by asking how many of you cycle? Can two or three people just get up and tell me why you cycle? Why do you do it? Can you? Uh, transportation. Transportation. One thing. Another one. You can repeat Fine. if you want. Just Fine. tell me why you cycle. I can't afford a car. Okay. Fine. Fine. For fun. Okay. So, one more. You don't want to buy a car. So, economic reasons, transportation reasons. So. The way that I look at this as a city councillor, representing now 110,000 people, that's my there, is uh, we uh, have to, as Councillor Layton said, think about complete streets, safe streets, and ways for the residents of the city to move around, for goods and people to move around. And we have a city that is growing a lot. We're going to get a million people in 20 years. So how do we create ways for people to move around in safe, economic, and, you know, stable ways? So you improve the safety of our roads, you create more public transit, we all know we had a big discussion this today at, at Council, but we also create a cycling network that is safe and reliable and actually encourage, encourages people to have it as an option for them to get around for whatever reason there is, but a lot of that is transportation and is economic. And that's how you build a good and safe transportation, and that's how you build a good city. So for me, this is not about one versus the other. This is really about the city making sure that we, we move goods and people around. There's no other option. Sometimes uh, I hear people complaining about you know, the existing floor bike, uh, the, the floor bike lanes because there's only one hour of traffic. And I remind them that really there was only four hours of change. For 20 hours, it's exactly the same one lane that was there before. And on top of it, I said, you know, your choice is only one. Either you're going to be stuck in traffic as you claim you are, even though that no, no evidence attributes that to the bike lane, or because if we have that extra million people in cars, you're going to be struck in traffic anyways. So <laughs> what's your choice in here? We're giving you a choice. We are bringing the city and the community together and talking about this choice. How do we move people around in a safe way? And I am not as an experienced cyclist uh, as Councillor Layton. Actually, I have to be very honest with you. The first bike I, I have, and there's pictures to prove this, was a trike that got stolen, believe it or not, I didn't ever thought that nobody believed. Now I feel confident enough that uh, I, I do have a proper bike, but I, it, it, I, it's, it's scary for me. And for me, it does make a big difference. And many people like us, that, that more and more often we, we live in an area that is very fortunate, that very, we have very easy access, everything is very close by, that we can rely on transportation like cycling to do pretty much almost everything in our neighborhoods. <laughs> and so, but it, it is important to have it done in a safe way, and then in a safe way for everybody. So when we're thinking about doing these lanes, we don't think about only one kind of, of mode of transportation. We're thinking about the cyclists, we're thinking about the pedestrians, and we're thinking about the, the movement of the cars and the goods and the trucks and the business and everything. And that's how I hope that we are gonna be um, engaging in this exercise. And I have to thank Councillor Layton, Councillor Cressy, and Cycle Toronto, and everybody that did a really good work of establishing some data so we can start working on this. But I also come in here today with a big, big ask. We need to get out there and really speak to our neighbors and engage our neighbors. If we truly want to have a network, if we truly
truly want to have uh, cycling infrastructure being built in Toronto, we need to pack these rooms, not only with cycling people, but we need to pack these rooms with people that cycle, that don't cycle, that want to cycle but not afraid to cycle, with business people, with people that drive. Everybody needs to be in the room. And that's how we're going to build a, a cycling infrastructure. So, and that it depends on all of us to have those uncomfortable conversations and to not be dismissive. To always try to understand, I think, where, where are people coming from? Making our point as well. You know, I want to be able to cycle in a safe way, and I think I have that right to do that in the city, and the city, you know, uh, deserves to have uh, to move people around. But I think it is important that we bring people together and have those really uncomfortable conversations. So I ask that today you leave here, and I hope, uh, and I think we all do, that you're excited, but that you're ready to roll up our sleeves and help us have the conversations that we need to have as a community to make sure that we design the bike lanes that address the needs of the entire community and that continue to serve as examples to continue to grow the network that the city needs. Thank you very much, Diane. So I'm going to call up, uh, uh, thanks very much, and thanks for rushing down from uh, City Hall. I'm going to call Gideon over to talk about uh, the polling they've done. And, uh, and this idea of uh, choices that we have, uh, we often put lots of attention on the cars on Bloor Street. But if you look at the busiest time of day in an hour, a lane might move 800 to 1,000 cars. Well, now think about how many people are in a single subway train. One single subway train, it's about 1,500. Uh, so when we often give lots of attention to the people on the surface, but not so much to the great number of people that are moving under the surface. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Gideon Foreman. He's with the David Suzuki Foundation. Thanks very much, Al. Thanks, I'll just keep my remarks really brief because uh, you've been a great audience and thanks so much for your patience and sticking around. But I did want to uh, say a couple of words about some polling that we in Cycle Toronto commissioned last summer in July of 2018 with the professional pollster Ecos. They did a scientifically valid survey of 800 Toronto residents, so it's just folks in Toronto, uptown and downtown. And the results I think were very, very encouraging. And one of the key takeaways is that really all of Toronto loves bikes. It's not just a downtown phenomenon. statistically valid 800 people, and uh, the questions were about bike lanes and about speed limits. Yeah, so, please, no. so the first question that Ecos asked folks were, do you, do you want to keep speed limits where they already want to lower speed limits? And 71%, vast majority, said they supported lowering speed limits, so that's really encouraging. But the other key piece of this, in addition to the overall results, was when they asked drivers, do you support lowering speed limits. These are people who said their main mode of transportation was the car. Almost six in 10 drivers also said they wanted to support lower speed limits. And it wasn't just a downtown phenomenon, as I mentioned. In the former city, uh, the former city of Toronto, yes, thanks, so. Al. Former city of Toronto, yeah, three quarters of folks said lower the speed limits. But even in the Tobacco in North York, better than 60% of folks said, yeah, lower the speed limits. So it's not just a downtown phenomenon. So there is a really nice consensus that's building on this issue that I think is going to be very helpful to getting some of the things that we all want. Next one, please. Then the pollster asked specifically about bike lanes. 82% supported protected bike lanes. And the coolest stat in all of this was when they asked drivers, do you support bike lanes? Three out of four, 75% of drivers said they supported bike lanes. So this nonsense about, you know, more on the car, that there's a fight between cyclists and drivers, the polling doesn't show that at all. There's a very strong consensus whether you drive or whether you cycle that people want bike lanes. And again, it was uptown and downtown as well. Uptown, or Etobicoke, inner suburbs, almost eight and 10 in Etobicoke and in the former city, almost nine and 10. Next please. And then the final question that the pollster asked was, do you want the rollout of the, of the cycling network to go at the pace that was was uh, planned by the city about eight years to build a network, or do you want us to speed up the completion of the network? And two out of three, 65% said, yeah, speed up the completion of the bike lane network. And I thought that was really encouraging. And down here in the former city of Toronto, it was better than seven in 10, said yes, speed up the completion of the network. So Toronto, you know, Torontonians do love bike lanes, and they want them built sooner than later. I'll leave it there, thank you.
So our last uh, speaker, and then we have an opportunity for you to uh, weigh in, either comments or uh, questions. How do we move this uh, forward? So last uh, but not least is uh, Jared Colt from Cycle Toronto. Thanks, Albert. I, I'm reminded uh, about that, that stat that 99% of people support public transit for everybody else. Uh, you know, I think the point that I, I think Gideon was also really driving home is with that data, we, were, we really drilled in on whether people around the Danforth, Danforth area uh, supported bike lanes on Danforth, and 70% of local residents said, yes, we want bike lanes on Danforth. We asked people at Young, north of the 401, do they support bike lanes on Young Street? And it, the number dropped, but it was still a majority. It was 60% of people that said, yes, we want those bike lanes on Young Street. Um, so, yeah, I think we, uh, it's important to note that there's a huge amount of local support uh, for bike lanes. And, you know, that's really represented here tonight, right? Everybody in this room, we all live, work, and play in the area, and we want to see this street transformed. Uh, and I, I, I used to live uh, in, in the West End. I, I now, I'm now an East End resident. I used, uh, used to live at Jane and Bloor. And... Uh, I used to ride Bloor Street. I'd get up in the morning and pull out my road bike and I would fly along Bloor, uh, you know, like the young kamikaze cyclist that I was. Uh, and, you know, I think there's something really to that, you know, heart pounding, adrenaline inducing uh, feel of riding in mixed traffic real fast. But what I've come to realize, especially through my work at Cycle Toronto, that if we want to really push mass cycling, uh, we have got to get away from vehicular cycling. We have got to get away from uh, the kind of fast, busy street uh, love in this town. We've really got to build facilities that are for all ages and abilities, for eight-year-olds and for 80-year-olds. Uh, because quite frankly, those hills around High Park, uh, you know, the, the underpass, uh, between Dundas West and Lansdowne, the risk of getting doored along Bloor Street is that those are all major barriers that are holding people back from riding more often. I think that, again, as uh, you know, folks in the room who ride a bike, we know that, that we know what's going on out there. Uh, you know, I think as we're having conversations with folks, what we hear time and again is that people want to ride and they want to ride more often. Uh, but that, you know, they're lacking main street connections that are really safe to be able to do that. Um, you know, I think that as we found at Cycle Toronto and through our work with the partners who are here tonight, that, you know, our cycling infrastructure offers an incredible uh, amount of value for money. You know, we hear, you know, billion dollar transit lines that are going to take decades to get built. Meanwhile, we spend 800000 on Richmond and Adelaide protected bike lanes. $800,000 in a city budget that's multi, multi-billion dollars. And we, we have now arrived at a place where, during rush hour, the Richmond Adelaide bike lanes per lane are moving more people in the bike lanes than they are in the travel lanes. <laughs> this is a massive achievement. We spent $500,000 on the Bloor Pilot, you know, that 2.4 kilometer stubway, uh, that is now Toronto's second busiest bikeway. This is true value for money, and I think, you know, we can, you know, it, it, we're, we're so humble, right? You know, we, we, uh, we have a tiny little bit amount of space, and you know, we just spend a little bit of money, uh, and we can actually transform our streets uh, for, to enable them to become safer for our friends, for our families, uh, for pedestrians, for cyclists, for drivers, for people who get around in the city. I think we've spoken about this tonight, but progress on our network has been excruciatingly slow. If you're members of Cycle Toronto, and if you're not, I really encourage you to join at cycleto.ca slash join. But if you're a member, uh, you pay me to do government relations for, for you. Um, and I have been you know, super frustrated, there's no question, about the slow pace of rollout of our cycling grid. I know that when we dig in, you know, I, I think it's hilarious, the Toronto Sun, uh, characterized Cycle Toronto and bike advocates as, you know, when they, they've got hooks for hands. And when, they get, when they get their hooks into something, they, they never let go. Uh, <laughs> but truly, when we dig in, when we focus, we can do great things. Uh, you know, and I think Bloor expansion to High Park is the next step in our, in our great cycling network and really creating the conditions for mass cycling. But I want to really underscore something. If we don't get a good decision at City Council this spring, uh, 
uh, to initiate the process uh, for expansion. We are not going to see protected bike lanes on Bloor in this neighborhood or west of High Park by, before 2023. We have got to get a good decision at City Hall this coming spring. Thankfully, we've got some great champions uh, who are in the room. So we've got some other champions, of course, who aren't here, who are on City Council. Um, but we can't, let, we can't let that happen. We can't afford to let that happen. We really need a good decision. I think I just want to part ways, perhaps, with just some advice for different folks in the room. For, for the locals in the crowd, and who, who lives in the area? Right on. Love you guys. We've heard this tonight, and I'm so pleased to hear both local councillors really reinforcing this. But really, arm yourselves with the data that's been presented tonight. Dig into TCAT's website, uh, into the resources there, to those stats, onto the Cyclotrona website, TSF, Bells on Bloor, you know, and, and get together with your neighbors and talk to them about why this matters to you. Tell them about what the extension of the Bloor bike lanes means to you. Um, and get in touch with your councillor's offices uh, and communicate your support and ask if there's any ways you can help. For the shoppers, you know, in the business crowd, uh, you are here. Wear your helmets, of course, into you know local businesses, uh, and tell shopkeeps and staff that, that you you know you, you bike there, uh, and tell them that what what uh, protected bike lanes on Bloor would mean to you, would mean to your family, uh, in terms of you know getting you there safer and getting you there more often. You know, to everyone in the crowd, please um, pull out your phone. Please pull out your phones. This is actually real. <laughs> pull out your phones. Uh, log on to bloorlovesbikes.ca. Bloorlovesbikes.ca. Sign the pledge. Put that thing on social media. Paste it onto your Facebook feeds, your Twitter feeds, uh, and get people to sign to say, yes, I support building you know, the Bloor Street bike lanes, expanding them west, um, and let's get this done. Um, We've got a ton of work to do uh, to make a Bloor bike lane extension a reality, um, and I want to reinforce we need a quality decision at Council this spring to make that happen. Uh, but we can't do that without everybody in this room all working together. So, on behalf of Cycle Toronto, thank you so much. Thank you for riding, uh, and let's transform the city. Uh, Jared. So you heard from him some of the things that, so we're going to have an audience participation now. We're going to get everyone out by 8.15. We know we've been doing a lot of talking, but in terms of action items, you've heard uh, some of them. Uh, pick up our postcard. You've got the mayor's uh, email on, on there. That uh, is, by the way, a collaboration with uh, nurses, uh, doctors, local community, cycling groups, and so on. So, so there is that community building going on already. Um, join our postcard blitz on uh, April the 28th at noon. Sign up in front. Uh, sign the David Suzuki uh, peti petition and, or sign the Cycle Toronto pledge and uh, sign up at the table to uh, volunteer. So we've got uh, about 15 minutes now. Let's have uh, some comments, brief comments about how you want to see this move forward. You heard from Jared that if, if it doesn't move forward uh, this year, we're going to lose another uh, term in, in council. So, so brief comments or questions uh, you've got from the councillors here, you've got uh, David Suzuki, Cycle Toronto, and so on. So if you've got questions or brief comments, how do we move this uh, forward? Okay, go ahead right there. <laughs>
Okay, uh, thank you very much. If anyone wants to comment on that, I mean, we, we know that it's an issue, the parking that's still on Bloor Street, and we know it's going to be very hard in the short term to get rid of that parking. But we know, for example, that even though the statistics in terms of conflicts showed overall conflicts were significantly down, the number of conflicts between pedestrians uh, or the conflicts involving pedestrians was actually up. And we believe that's probably because of those parked cars reducing uh, visibility. Uh, so, so thanks very much for that comment, in case anyone else, if Jared wants to comment on that. I gotta say, I think that uh, in terms of the vitality of the Bloor Annex, I've never seen it busier. The foot traffic in the Bloor Annex is incredible. I mean, I, was, I, I biked by on my way here, I biked through it on a weekly basis. Uh, in the evenings, uh, it is it is wild. You know, uh, Theodore 1922, uh, a great business that unfortunately was opposed to, to the pilot, um, has just gone out of business. Uh, in their note to their customer base, though, they said that they are going out of business. They're electing that they're they're closing shop, but after the best year ever. So the Blur bike lanes went in in 2017. 2018 was their best year ever. They're going on out on a high. They're done. But I think that we, what we really do need to underscore is quality, and we do need a high, to invest in high quality cycling infrastructure. Uh, that section of street is really narrow, uh, and I think we do need to work towards, quite frankly, uh, moving uh, the parked cars that are on the main street off of the main street. Uh, and I think we need to, you know, they should be on side streets, they should be in the green peas, uh, and we need wider lanes on floor. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of people in the room that probably would love to get behind that, recognize that there are some political barriers to getting that done, uh, but I think we do need to work towards that. In short, we hear you. Yeah, go ahead, right there in the blue. I've heard a lot of good things about the bike lanes and all that. I own a business uh, here on Bird Street for 10 years now, and I, mean, I know we're going to have a problem, uh, I'm going to have a problem with loading and unloading. My business isn't near a corner or anything else like that, and I'm going to have a lot of problems with that. And until, I believe, until cyclists are licensed and paid for their <laughs> What? Let me speak. No. Thank you. Thank you. Until they're licensed and paying for licenses and contributing to the city, like the way other, others do, like, 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 like with business owners and drivers, then they this have a right to ask for more lanes and everything else like that. But, uh, you know, I, I, str I strongly oppose to this. You know, being a part of this license. I've, been, I've had my, my gear taken off of my car, and all I've got was an I'm sorry on it. And, and, and which I'm glad I got the I'm sorry for it, but it doesn't pay for my, it doesn't pay for my, uh, my, my mirror. $500 came out of my pocket for that. Like, there's no, there's no, okay. well, look, there's no insurance. Okay. Everybody's got a chance to talk, and I've heard a lot of positive things about bikes, and, and I'm glad that everybody enjoys bike lanes, and, and, I, and, and, and I wish there was a way for it to work. But until, until there's some sort of uh, uh, liability on them, because there's pedestrians that walk as well, where people are cycling and pedestrians are in danger. And, and for what? For to be struck by a, a, a bicycle? And, and, by cars, and struck no by cars. There's okay. nobody who can get up on their bike and ride right away and nobody knows where they're from. Okay, thanks very much. Go ahead. And there is no such thing as a vulnerable road with his license. They want to destroy the business <laughs> and Again? the property that is going to pay the taxes to support the city. Uh, the city, if you want to do a large lines, they have to buy two houses at the time. Because all these, uh, they have the street parking. They want to go to side streets. The residents, they want to take the arm and say, yes, <laughs> they want to be a really big problem. Okay, so Jared's going to respond to that. We all pay taxes, sir. Okay, so we all pay, we all pay I, I taxes. Those are, those are both really, really important comments and really, really valid comments. And I think there's something that we've, uh, that we've, got, to, we've got to dig into it and we've got to talk about this. Um, a few things. First, uh, on the question of, of bicycle licensing. Um, and this is one that's come up uh, many, many times, uh, and it is something that you know we've seen motions at city council about, about looking at bicycle licensing. Uh, and the city of Toronto, you, you may be aware, city of Toronto had a bicycle licensing scheme up until 1956. 
uh, at which point it was abandoned. And it was abandoned primarily because the administrative costs were too high. It was felt that the police had the full powers um, of enforcement uh, to be able to ticket uh, uh, riders. And I'm a person that's actually gotten a ticket on a bike. So I, I don't know, anybody else got a ticket on a bike? Interesting. So, so I just, I want to I wanna note that uh, because I got a ticket from an officer uh, because I had just moved to, the, to town. I didn't know that you're not supposed to pass a streetcar when its doors are open. I passed uh, and, and, I, and I got a $110 fine. And I, and I paid it. Licensing is that they, they learn, they'll learn the street signs. They no. They learn the stop signs because they run stop signs. Like, they're like crazy. Stop. So, so do drivers. Drivers. Yeah. Everybody's laughing at them because they've all done it. You know, everybody's running stop signs. They're I've seen like, 70 you know, drivers run a stop sign in my neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. He's not licensed, he's not insured, he's not enough. It's like, so just, you know just what? Remember, it's remember that the Toronto police have full powers of enforcement. They run blitzes where they do ticket cyclists who run red lights and who run stop signs, and we can we can have a discussion about that. What's that that's happen? that's well, not why. Yeah, they're going to get fined and then they disappear, and the, you know the, the, the fine disappears into the system. No, and it's nothing my insurance, my car insurance. And so and there's liabilities. On on this note, um, with respect to liability. Uh, you can actually go, this is an interesting one, and I think that folks in the crowd will be really, um, find this information. Uh, we've been contacted by a few critical injury lawyers who are now advising that uh, cyclists carry liability insurance um, in a, a tenant, a tenant insurance policy. So homeowners are covered uh, because of your home ownership, but if you, you know, live, if you rent your home, uh, it, tenant insurance can cover you. And now why I bring that up is because there's an increase in the number of conflicts that are happening between cyclists and cyclists and cyclists and pedestrians, both at, at the fault of pedestrians and at the fault of cyclists. Uh, and so we've been working with a few uh, you know, uh, lawyers who are consulting on this and saying there are people who just aren't covered because they don't have tenants insurance uh, and they're having their life savings taken away from them because of that. Uh, so I think this is something that we do have to have a conversation about. There's no question about that. Uh, and I'll just really reinforce the point, though, that there are no jurisdictions around the world that have a bicycle licensing scheme that works, uh, primarily because police have the full powers of enforcement. Uh, and it's been tried and tried and tried, and it's aban been abandoned. The city of Toronto has studied it five times, and they've said it's the, the, the benefits aren't worth the cost. So I, I just want to really reinforce that there are really valid concerns that you've got. Uh, on that note, uh, we have other solutions that we think will work better, like for instance, uh, mandatory cycling training in the education system like we used to have. Uh, when we all grew up as kids, we got bicycle education as a part of the education program. That's gone. Uh, leading international jurisdictions uh, invest in multiple weeks of bicycle education at the grade four and the grade nine levels. Uh, and so there's a long way we can go, uh, but there are better solutions out there, and I think we can dream bigger and do better than bicycle licensing. Thank you very much. Whenever uh, they're meeting in the council chambers, we should pack it, you know, and they're going to be talking about uh, infrastructure. Uh, Road infrastructure and, and cycling. We should pack it and, 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 and voice our opinions about what we need to do. We need the bike lanes. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, go ahead in the middle there. Uh, just a question for the councillors. I know that um, money isn't the problem because we got some support from provincial and federal government recently. I don't remember the amount of millions of dollars, but I know that money isn't an issue. And uh, it looks like the support. Factually, is not a problem. Obviously, there's some people who have concerns, but the majority of drivers and cyclists and pedestrians support more bike lanes. So, if we have the support and the money, what's, in your opinion, the biggest holdup? Okay, so if we have the support and the money, what's the problem? We had a $16 million budget uh, last year, for example. Um, it, the money is a different kind of problem. What uh, we've heard actually from staff is uh, because we got a significant amount of funds from the federal government allocated to very specific projects, they've been spending a lot of time and resources in deploying those funds and that uh, to, to deliver those projects. And um, the network has been 
very, very slow. I do think that as, as a city on, on our budget, um, we've, we, we should be pushing a little bit more. I know that, I think it was you that pushed, was it you that had the motion last, last year to speed the cycling network installation? I don't know, some, one, one councillor did. It didn't, it didn't go through, but there was uh, a motion to, to, uh, to put it through. And, uh, and, and I think that, that needs to be done. But I think right now, what we heard, and a few of us had a meeting not too long ago, um, it, it's actually uh, the resources. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's also the will of all of us to make sure that we continue to push so that the resources are put into the projects that um, the community believes that will have uh, a huge impact. Uh, like I believe that everybody agrees that more is, uh, you know, as part of the network as a whole, this is something that, will, that could have a big impact. One is the provincial funding for cycling infrastructure was uh, was removed by this government, a good portion of. We, we did receive some for, I think it's this year and next year, or last year and this year, um, but there was a large amount that wasn't continued. Uh, we have since asked the federal government uh, to, to fill in that gap uh, from their uh, from their gas tax funding, not the gas tax funding, the, the, yeah. not PTIP, uh, but through the carbon tax funding piece, because that's where we lost the money uh, when, uh, when cap and trade was abolished in, uh, in Ontario. Um, the other piece, and, and, and Councillor Bailao, maybe we, I, she didn't mention that maybe she's more optimistic than I am, uh, but I don't think the political will is there on council. I think we do see like that there's widespread community support, um, but, but I don't think that right now, the, the expansion, if we went and said, just go and do it, uh, that there'd be support there on council. Uh, we, we have to work and fight for every inch, and we have to organize, we have to build that big tent in communities that, uh, that support it. In, uh, in the section that was completed, uh, there we had the support of every resident association, every resident association along the, along the strip. BIAs were either uh, supportive or, or, or willing to look at the results of a pilot and, uh, and, and, and helped us frame and, and craft how it would be evaluated in the end. Uh, and so while, while we might look, and th there might be some political support in the room here, uh, there are 25 votes on city council. And that means the magic number is about 14 uh, that we have to convince. But when you talk to some, they're not gonna care about what happens in our neighborhood. They're gonna care about how fast they can get home. They're gonna care about how, fa how fast their residents can get home. And that doesn't help businesses. That doesn't help residents feeling safe here. It doesn't help uh, people trying to get around in, in, in our community. It's about uh, people that uh, aren't even stopping on their way to, 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 to try to get uh, back home. And so that those are the people that we have to convince. And we have to do that first by getting a, a common consensus in our own neighborhood. And, and I, I firmly believe that. Uh, that if we went right now, we'd be, unfortunately, probably be on the losing end of a vote that would have to wait another year until we reinitiate. Uh, which is just the process of city council. So I would say that, that first we have to have that deep dialogue here so that we can we, we can start creating a consensus and a plan that we can all be supportive of or a good portion of people can be supportive of. Uh, and then we have to start working the politics down in City Hall uh, to, to garner that support. And it wasn't easy for that section. It was a great result at the end of the day, but we worked real damn hard to get there. Uh, and not only in our own community, but also working just add something. I, I, I do agree a hundred percent with the, the with Mike said about the political will, and I think that some of the most controversial stuff that has been approved at City Hall. But there's one lesson that we can learn is that we need to get that consensus from the outside and then bring it in. That is something that was done with the King Street pilot, that was done with the floor bike lanes, that was done with laneway housing, that was done all these things that for a long, long time we've been trying to do. The way that we were able to get success was to build the tent on the outside and then bring it in the inside. And it's really important that we do that here too. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor. So just a quick note to your point. Uh, Montreal built 90 kilometers of bike lanes in the last three years. We built 25. Uh, so right in the back there. I just want to add, I think part of the blockage as well is a bias against cyclists that's generally in culture and combined with that a demonizing of cyclists. So 
often I hear people say, I had a police officer yell at me once, pay your taxes, as I was riding. I <laughs> had a conversation with him about something unrelated. And I put in a complaint, because I think that totally shows his bias. I'm a homeowner. I'm an employed person. I own a vehicle. Like, we're not, cyclists are not all people who, like, pay nothing towards, towards culture. And I think that's the, the kind of upset I feel, is that people feel like, you know, they can just say, oh, cyclists are this and that. If you go to Bloor and Dufferin right now and you count how many drivers run the red light when they're turning right, they don't stop at all, even though it's red, they turn right, it will be many more than cyclists going through red lights. They do it because they think it's reasonable, cyclists do it because no one's around, and they slow down and they go through a stop sign. So I think picking at these sorts of things sort of is just kind of a demonizing, which people just uh, present their bias. So I'm not denying that there's lots of cyclists doing those sorts of things, but I would say drivers do them just as much and are a lot more deadly if they make a mistake. And yet, people are not doing that. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, by the way, I always think uh, when I get my tax bill for our house, I think every year I should be sending it back. Because, of course, as cyclists, we don't pay taxes. Go ahead, right there. I really want all the businesses on Bloor Street, I really want all the businesses on Bloor Street to survive. I love shopping from Jane to Maine. And I, I'm not just talking about nuts and underwear, appliances. Like, I'm on a bike, I don't, can't carry that dishwasher on my back, but I use my credit card and I get it delivered. So if we can make room on those extended pieces of uh, property where there are no uh, loading areas, maybe we incorporate a, a loading area in the middle there to make you guys survive. Because having business here is Thank you. just what we need. Yes. <laughs> I really appreciate that last commentary because I think everyone in the room wants our businesses to survive. A lot of this is about economic sustainability. We want our businesses to do well. The woman from, from your history, I think she's left, but when she said her business is doing well, she's an entrepreneur, that's fantastic. More power to you. So we all want our businesses to survive, and we see the bike lane is actually feeding that because we know cycles on average spend more per month than, than drivers do. So that's something we all have in common. Thanks very uh, much, Kitty. By the way, all the speakers, the speakers, this microphone, all of this arrived by bike tonight. <laughs> so uh, go ahead. Bike train. Hi, it was more of a comment. Um, I'm the chair of the BIA in this neighborhood, and I came tonight to get more information about the bike lane. And I have to say I was a little bit disappointed when I walked in because I could tell that about 85% of the people here were already for the bike lane. And what you need to do is reach the other people. And I think that's what they've been touching on. But I know our members, a lot of them are very undecided. And we're presently you know, doing surveys, but most of them don't know any of this information. It's really cool information. We have to get it out to people so that they can make an informed decision. I didn't know half of that stuff. I don't know how it's gonna happen if you need to fundraise and make flyers. And, but you have to inform people because they're making a decision based on a, on a feeling and not on the facts. Thank you very much. Go ahead, right here. So I thought I'd be here with a little of cyclists tonight. I'm really delighted that you business guys are here, and there may be some others as well. What you said was your concern that you think that cyclists need to be licensed. You said, I think that maybe they should pay for those so they would contribute financially. You were concerned about your store being in the middle of the block, and so it's a long way for loading. You also mentioned that the cyclists were blowing through stop signs, and that was a big concern. I bet you've got some others as well. I heard you, we all need to hear you. I don't know the answers to those, but thanks for coming out. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I go ahead over here. Extension to Hyde Park. Um, the, the next councillor over, 
suppose we're going to go all the way up to the Humber River. We have a supportive counselor out there. And um, the road, you know, it, it, it turns out the roadway, once you get past Dundas, is just a little wider than it is outside here. And that makes it just a lot easier to, to, to fit things in. So um, I'm just curious why we're not taking that little extra lump up it in, included. It would get us all the way over to the Humber River, where there are also bike lanes up and down the Humber River, and that would be a really good connection. Beyond that is we Tobacco, that's a different lump, but <laughs> I think we could, some road 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 I think we could uh, you know, and I certainly hope, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, we're obviously focused on one thing now, um, but I certainly hope it's not going to take three or three more years just to get that little section done as well. Yeah. Th thanks very much, uh, David. Go ahead, right at the back. Um, I just wanted to echo what Mr. White just said. I totally agree. I just wanted to echo that what he was saying about going with a, instead of a piecemeal approach, just getting bolder and saying, let's do it all. Because, you know, I'm 50 years old. I'm going to be 85 by the time we get to uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the rate we're going right now. And that thing, we better have a walker. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, the other thing I want to say is that Getting back to the issues of uh, non-cyclists and their issues with us as cyclists, I think that's really, going back to the political will comment, I think the biggest issue we still have in this city is the behavioral shift that hasn't happened. Like, we haven't gotten to the point of sharing the road. Like, you've got talk radio blasting and people are stuck in their cars all day long listening to propaganda about cycling and bike lanes and everything else downtown, elites, etc. By the time they get downtown, they see it sucks, they go, they're the problem for everything, and then they want to take you off the road. I know, because that's just like to ride on floor past Gene. It's the, basically a Grand Theft Auto mission once you get past that uh, And yet, you know, from a planning perspective, a complete street perspective, that street from basically Keel West is an old highway. It's already wide enough to keep the parking there, keep the lanes there, and stick a separated bike lane like Montreal style right through the whole thing. Have you ever seen at Max's Market? That's what I think about every single time I'm there. I'm like, look, this is already here. Mm -hmm. You know? So why do we gotta wait till 2023 or whatever? That's because that's the political will, and that's the problem. Because once you get over that bridge, it's Ford Nation. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, and, and Gideon might know these numbers. I mean, their polling shows that 59% of people across Toronto identify walking, cycling, and transit as their primary mode of trans transport. In the down in the East Toronto and East York, it's over 70% uh, walk, cycle, or take transit. Uh, go ahead. Um, I don't know if I needed, but, um, so I don't know if people have not been reading the latest reports about climate. And so the need for taking climate action now, taking the lead from someone like Greta Thunberg, who climate strike for the last 28 weeks, um, that the bicycle is the best mode of transportation, given the facts of air pollution and what it's doing to our children. That's traffic. That is vehicles on our road. And here we have do we have a City of Toronto Council and govern at all levels of government taking this as seriously as people from other parts of the world are? Canada is heating up twice as fast as anywhere else. What is going on that we're ignoring this? For the sake of the convenience of being in a vehicle, a huge size taking up space that we don't need. We need to rethink space in a city. And the bicycle is the most efficient and economical and climate mitigator that we have going on. And I think everyone should support that. Yeah, so, so, so the UN tells us we have 11 years. It doesn't sound like the uh, timeline we've heard uh, fits with the 11 years before we have ecological systems breaking down. Go ahead. Hang on to the mic, I can project. One thing that I would say to everybody in the room here that rides, rides safely,
thanks very much. And we'll take uh, two more comments, and uh, we'll get uh, Jared three more comments, and then uh, we, we promised you we'll be out of here by 8.15. So we'll have Jared, then uh, two more comments, and uh, you're, of course, welcome to stick around to uh, ask questions. I just want to just make a quick note building on that point, which is about the othering that we do in our language. And at Cycle Toronto, we've been thinking a lot about this recently, and you may have seen the study that, you know, out of Australia, I think, uh, representing that drivers see cyclists as non-human, mm -hmm. uh, and they actually kind of see them as like an insect, that it's a threat, you know, they want to get them out of their way. Uh, they don't see them as people. And I think a part of that is how we talk about uh, cycling. And I think we do have to make a leap uh, and really start talking about ourselves as people that ride bikes. Uh, you know, we're, we're brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, you know, we shop, we, you know, we walk, we make mistakes, we do all kinds of things, um, you know, but we've got to watch out for uh, the dangers of, uh, you know, being really modalist in many ways uh, and going, you know, cyclist versus driver. We've got to be careful about our language and we've got to evolve uh, to really to reach more people uh, in our movement. Uh, thanks, uh, Jared. So two last comments and then... We'll stick around anyone wants to ask questions. So the lady in the back. Um, I just have a question. So if we know that there's a, a gap in the education, where are the best resources for all of us? I'm a driver and a cyclist. Where can I go to learn the rules of the road from both perspectives? Because I think Cycle, Cycle TO is doing a great job advocating for the bike link, but where's the advocacy for the education on how to properly use them? Like, I, and maybe it's out there, I just don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> great question, great question. Um, so we'd love to work together on this. Uh, I'd love to work with all the business communities on this. We've got a handbook. It's called the Toronto Cyclist Handbook. Uh, it's at cycleto.ca slash handbook. It's in Toronto, Toronto's top 13 languages it's been translated into. It is the rules of the road. It is your one-stop shop uh, for a person who's on a bike. Uh, thank you, Chris Boyle. It's right here. Um, we distribute tens of thousands of these every year uh, in community centers. Uh, across the city. Uh, we've created an Ontario Cyclist Handbook version of this as well. Uh, but we really need, you know, we're a small organization. We've partnered with the city. It's been a huge boon in terms of growing the reach of the handbook. Uh, as well, I just also want to note there's some folks here from CultureLink. Uh, we've partnered with CultureLink Settlement Services. They're a settlement services agency. They service 20,000 newcomers every year. Uh, and we've got a bike to school program with, with them uh, where we're delivering bicycle education to kids. Uh, and last year we reached uh, more than 10,000 kids. So uh, in the absence of government providing cycling education, uh, we're trying to do our part and we're trying to get out there and ensure that everybody's getting home safe. And does the city on the official Can side bike as well. Okay, <laughs> good comment. A last uh, comment uh, and then we'll, we'll break. Um, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I just wanted to ask, does the city website have official um, biking guidelines as well for cyclists and for drivers? Is there they do. some? Okay. Yep. Okay, Thank you. Go last comment. Thank you. Uh, I think the key bit here is relocating the parking. I think we can all agree on that. It would be wonderful to see someone from the Toronto Parking Authority at these events. Also, I think we have a wonderful opportunity here that we didn't have on the in the core part of here, where there's a lot of surface parking built over the subway right away that runs north of that runs just north of Bloor. And so there's a lot of opportunity to reallocate the parking here that we didn't have in the central core. So I think it's important also to bring in the, the laneway structure that runs on both the north and south side of Bloor into the mix and into this conversation because that will help with the loading zones, it'll help with the parking situations, it'll help create a buffer zone where people can, and, and that has to be incorporated into the model and I think those are key, but someone from the parking authority would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that comment, and that's a good one to end it on. Uh, thanks to everyone, especially to our speakers, uh, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Layton, uh, to uh, Jared and Nancy and Gideon and uh, Jennifer who's left. Uh, thanks to, uh, I know I missed some, but uh, thanks very much everyone for coming, but uh, if you have any other questions, please uh, stick around. And finally, I uh, uh, will see you on the bike lane.